so covering macros this week um you've probably already used we almost certainly definitely use macros we use them all the time in rust and unlike in a lot of other languages macros are considered good and encouraged and great in rust so an example is the the print line macro and um the um you know, this outer attribute macros and inner attribute macros. So those are, those are some of the examples that, that we're going to look at. Macros are essentially code that writes other code of metaprogramming. Um, what makes Rust macros a bit different to if you've used C or C++ macros is that they are done as part of the, at the AST level. So rather than being done at the purely tokenized level or done at the text level, they're done um, as the abstract syntax tree parsing is happening. So that means they're not a simple replacement, which gives them a lot more flexibility and a lot more safety. They are, when you write, when you call a macro, and when you write a macro, it has to be valid looking Rust code because it has to be parsed as part of that process. So they can only appear in positions where they're explicitly supported. So that's patterns, statements, expressions, items, impulse items. And they can't appear in places like identifiers, match arms, or struct fields. There are two types of macros, or two main types of macros, or macros we have access to, which are declarative macros and procedural macros. The ambition was that we were going to cover both declarative macros and procedural macros in this section, but actually, if we want to dig into the detail, then we do. We kind of need two sessions, so we're actually only going to cover declarative macros this week, and then two weeks from now, we'll cover procedural macros so that we can go into that little bit more detail. So without further ado, let's get started on declarative macros. You'll interchangeably also hear these called macros by example or macro rules macros or just macros. Some people will just say these are the default macros. They're called macros by example because that's essentially what you write. You say, this is the way I want you to stamp out the code. And then at the point in compilation when that AST tree is being parsed, that's when it will happen. So you define a mat uh, pattern and then that's matched at compile time and used to generate the code that we want. Whenever you see this macro rules macro, that means someone is defining a declarative macro. And all of them take this form of macro rules, exclamation mark, then the name of our macro without, um, without an exclamation mark at the end, and then a series of rules followed by a semicolon where each rule is gonna take the form of open brackets, a pattern to match, close brackets, and then arrow, and then the expansion that we want our pattern to expand to. First thing to, well, useful thing to mention at this point is the scope of macros it makes them a bit different to other kind of function calls. Um, a macro has to be defined before it's used. So again, if you've come from a C or C++ background, you'll be used to this all the time. <laughs> That's just how things are. But in, in Rust at the minute, you know, when you write a function, you can put it anywhere in your file. As long as it's visible to it, then it doesn't matter. But with your macro, your macro has to be defined higher up in your file. Macros are also visible to submodules, but they're not visible outside of the defined scope. So you can still scope it. They can be exported from a module using the macro use, um, which is another macro <laughs> attribute, um, because attributes are a macro, and um, they can be used um, by you know, importing it. I think macros, declarative macros especially, are easiest to teach with examples. So I'm going to go through kind of progressively slightly more complicated examples and just talk about the syntax in each one. The first example is one that does nothing. So we define our macro rules macro. We call it do nothing without the exclamation mark. And then we match on open brackets, close brackets, which means we don't have any captures going in or what look like parameters. And it expands to nothing as well. When we call our macro, we can then look at what this expands to by calling the Rust compiler with the flag z unpretty equals expanded, source main RS, which uses the nightly compiler. And that way we can see what our file is expanding to at that point um, during the kind of AST parsing. And you can see it's just inserted a semicolon there and nothing else. It's just an empty <laughs> that's expanded to nothing as promised. So let's do a slightly more complicated one. Very, still very simple. So still matching on nothing, but this time we're going to return five. And you can see when we expand this, it just puts a five in. 
So it's not doing a function call. It's not doing any kind of misdirection. It's just taking that five, putting it in. We can now start to build up a little bit more complexity. Alex, would you mind just muting Christoph? Just getting a little bit of background noise. Um, and so this one is now we're bringing in what looks like overloading. And this is when we've got multiple match arms. And we're also bringing in catches. So the second of our match arms, this one here, is still matching on nothing and still returning five. So that means we can call it with nothing in the brackets and it will match this arm. But our first arm here is now saying, I want to capture some kind of expression. And expression is expression in the kind of regular Rust meaning of expression. So it could be, in this case, it's a literal, but it could also have been um, a variable that we had. It could have been like three plus four. And then it's saying, I just want to return that back out. So it's not doing anything particularly exciting. But when we expand our macro, we can see that it's just dropping in that code in, into our place. So we basically use this code to write some other code. If we want to do something with that capture, um, then, then we can. So in this case, we're saying, OK, I'm going to write a macro to add one. It's going to take an expression. And then we're going to say, add one to this capture meta variable. So here, if I let x equal 5, then when I add 1 to it, I am going to be adding 1 to this x. So that is that is the same x. And what you're essentially doing here is you're you're taking the name x, the like the, the the named token here, and you're passing that name and you say, look, I I exist, you can have access to me in the macros world, in the macros context. And then that way it says, okay, I'll add one to it. If you'd put something in here, so instead of a, um, an integer here that I can add one to, if I put in like a string and it didn't know how to add one, you would get an error here. You wouldn't get an error up here, and which is good because it's probably nothing wrong with the macro. It's probably the way you've called it, but because there's no type checking or anything, it's nice to have a way to feed back to where the problem is. So it, it looks at what the problem variable is, and then it goes back and looks at where that capture was passed in, and then it will display the error here. Which is, which is really handy. The way macros work um, with that kind of like dollar $x expression, that's, you know, that's an example of a capture type, but you can actually match on pretty much anything. Um, so just because our macro parameters have to be valid syntax, so we said earlier that it needs to, it needs to look like valid Rust, it doesn't have to be valid Rust code. So in this example here, we've got um, a new, a new macro match expression, which just has one arm with the pattern of an expression. When we call it, we're passing in some kind of identifier x, but it's undefined. So this is, if, if this was a regular function, this would be nonsense Rust code, right? This wouldn't, you know, x is undefined. What does that even mean? But because here we're not actually using it, it successfully matches the pattern. It is some kind of expression. And then after it's expanded it, there is no x anymore. So it doesn't matter that x was undefined <laughs> at that point because we never actually used it and it never got to the point of trying to fit, find out the meaning of x. It just said x is some kind of identifier, which it could have been. It just happened to be an utterly invalid one. You kind of think of this as needing to be a valid Rust fragment, but not a valid Rust script necessarily. So x doesn't have to be defined here. If we'd said that x had to be a literal type, for example, so we'll go through what, what things you can put here. Expression and literal are two examples um, later. But if we'd said it has to be a literal, then this wouldn't work because it knows that x isn't a literal. It might not know what it is instead. Maybe it's a type. Maybe it's some kind of valid identifier. But all it knows is that it's not a, it's not a literal. So it won't match, and no matching macro is going to be found. And you can also think of this as well as matching. Maybe we're not passing it in as an identifier. Maybe we're just max matching on the specific text. So here I'm matching on the text big number. Um, and I'm not trying to get an identifier. I'm not trying to get anything else. But these, this is just then a pattern that it can match and then return 42 and something else. And then when I expand it, it's going to look like this. So. Now let's bring in a slightly slightly bigger example. Let's look at multi-line ones here. Um, in this example, we're saying I've got a two more than macro. I'm passing in some kind of expression, and I'm saying let two more equal my expression plus two, and then returning two more. 
Now, initially, this looks totally fine. Um, you know, saying two more than x, we're passing in totally valid expression identifier. Anything, it's yeah, it's working. And then I return two more. But the problem here happens. The, the, the exclamation tries to make it clear. So it says let expressions are not supported here. And that's this let expression is not supported here, which is actually, that makes total sense. You can't write let y equal let x equal blah, blah, blah. So you're just missing a set of brackets. So you'll very often see an extra set of brackets. And that's just to do with where that macro is getting called. Is that substitution then valid? And if there wasn't this extra set of brackets, then the expansion wouldn't be valid because this is valid. We're just saying let y equal expression. But if we didn't have these brackets, then we would be saying let y equal let two more, which isn't, isn't valid. So you'll often see double brackets. So it's just for something to look out for. All right, so let's bring in the example of multiple captures. This is, again, quite a, quite a straightforward one. We're saying I'm gonna pass in two expressions of some kind, and then I'm going to add them together is going to work. I could pass in x as one of my expressions and 3 as the other. And this is going to expand to let x equal 5, let y equal x plus 3. Totally reasonable. That gives us, you know, an add function. But say we wanted it to take as many parameters as we wanted or as many captures as we wanted. We would need um, some equivalent to overloading um, or with some equivalent to variadic templates, basically. And the way you do that, it's not fully flexible, but the way you do that is through um, these repeat patterns. So I say, I want to get a variable number of expressions, for example, and maybe I get two, maybe I get three, maybe I get four. And that's what you'll see in like the print line macro, the vector macro. You can initialize your vector with two elements, five elements, 500 elements, and it's all totally valid. The syntax for that looks like this. You have dollar sign, then you have your expression here and then you'll say I want to match this I want to match this internal pattern one or um, sorry in this case it's zero or more times because it's a star and my delimiter is a comma but the comma could just as well have been a forward arrow or a semicolon or um if your type isn't an expression then there's you know you could basically match on anything you wanted not all delimiters are going to be valid immediately after a certain type but so we'll, we'll kind of come onto that in a minute but so the star means zero or more times, the question mark means zero or one time, and then the plus is one or more time. It's kind of like a very, very, very super, super cut down version of regex, because that's all you get. There's no, there's no extra clever stuff. This is, this is all you've got. And the end result then is when we're doing our sum macro, we still have the same kind of expression, but now we've got this additional outside. This is our little repeat block with a comma delimiter and we're saying we have zero or more of these. So then inside here, we're saying let mutable sum equals zero. And now this is the bit that does the repetition. So we're saying take that capture group and repeat the inside of this as many times as we repeated dollar $x up here. So in this case, there's three instances of expression comma. So it, so it looks like this. Um, the comma being outside means that it, the delimiter is in between. There's no trailing delimiter, which we'll come on to in a minute, um, because it's not part of this repeating pattern. It's just a delimiter of our repeating pattern. And so now we've immediately got, you know, we could put in four variables, we could put in five, six, seven, they'll all work, which is, it's a pretty simple syntax once you know what you're looking at. So just to kind of reiterate there, this is what we're repeating. And however many times this repeats in our calling code is how many times this is going to repeat. If we look at the expansion, um, I mentioned earlier that you can do that with that Z unpretty expand. You can also use, there's a crate called cargo expand, which also does the same thing, um, but it prettifies it to make it slightly easier to read the, the end result, which can be quite nice. So here, what that ends up looking like is let Y equal, then our sum, and then that repeated block of code but with our captured meta variable repeated three times and then returning the sum. And we can have multiple repeat patterns in any one rule. So the simplest example I mentioned about trailing um, comma separators, 
if you wanted to handle trailing comma separators and say, look, it's fine to have an extra comma at the end of my um, vector initialization, then you could just add in, okay, a new capture, right? Or in this case, I'm adding on, I'm saying as many as you want, but it's, I could have done a plus here for, sorry, a question mark for zero or one instead of a star, but I didn't. Um, so this is saying there can be some number of commas afterwards which is fine. We're not actually going to use it in our group, but we've, we've got it there. We could also have more than one capture that we use in the same um, expansion. So let's say, say we want to make a macro that takes two sets of numbers and then sums them independently. So I've got a comma delimited list for the first set of numbers I want to sum. Then I've got some other separator, in my case, a semicolon, and then two more numbers that I want to sum. The pattern that I need to match that is a capture group. So a pattern here to say, OK, I've got an expression with commas in between it, repeating some number of times. Then I've got a semicolon and then another pattern repeating some number of times. And you'll notice here it's repeating three times here and twice there which means it's a different number of repeats but it's smart enough to figure out which one i'm using so when i'm using x in this repeat group it will be three times so it will insert this for the number of repetitions of x which is three it would be there for one two and three and then for y because i'm using the dollar y meta variable in here this repeat captured repeat group will repeat um just twice and we can see that by looking at the expansion um Oh, which I didn't put in for some reason. But if you look at the expansion, <laughs> it all it all works out. So the numbers here will will sum this to six and sum this to 23, and we'll end up with a pair of six and 23. If we want to use the um, meta variables that repeat in the same um, repeat block in our expansion. So for example, let's take a similar similar looking group. So one, two, and three, then a semicolon then 10, 20, and 30. And let's say we wanted to add all of these numbers together, but the second block I want doubled. So I'm saying I want to add together the first number twice the second number. It's a pretty contrived example, but you get the idea. Then I would need to have the same number of repeats every time this is called so that this repeating block knows how many times it needs to repeat for, and it will be a one-to-one -one mapping of you know this repeat meta variable and this one so dollar x dollar y will repeat the same number of times and it'll give you a, a pretty clear <clears throat> compiler error if that if that doesn't work so it's it is it is quite quite handy kind of moving on from those examples um in all the examples so far i've been using um, a certain set of brackets for it but you actually can use can use different different types in different places the convention is to put parentheses around the pattern and then braces around the expansion, but you don't you don't actually have to do that. Because your inner set of brackets for turning it into expression would still need to be curly braces because they're the only braces that make an expression. But the the overall brackets around the expansion could be could be any of square brackets, curly braces or parentheses. And when you call your macro as well there, you can use any of them and it's totally independent of which ones you've used in your macro, but it's usually best to stick with the convention. So if you've got a function like macro, then you probably want it to look like a function with, with regular parentheses. And if you've got like your vector initialization type macro, then square braces is, is far more readable. So armed with all of that knowledge, we can now look at a, a basic vector type implementation of what it might look like. Um, it doesn't look exactly like this, but it's what it could look like. Um, we match on an expression. We have a comma delimited list. And then every time it repeats, we're just going to push that value onto the vector. And then we return that vector out. And that will, that will do the trick for you. Now, obviously, if you're actually going to write this yourself, you would want to pre-allocate the memory, um, which you could do you know, by resizing it. Um, you can count the number of expressions that you've passed in, but it's a little bit 
complicated, so I have not covered that here because I didn't feel like I would do it justice. But yeah, have a look at the actual vector implementation if you are interested in how you can do that. So just to break down all the parts in this example here, we've got the macro export at the top, um, and that's so that the macro is available um, when the crate it's defined in is brought into scope rather than it being hidden. We've got the start of the macro definition, which uses macro rules, followed by the name of the declarative macro without the exclamation mark. Then we've got our pattern, followed by the start of the expansion that we want. And then we've got um, the code that we want to insert, including that repeating element. In terms of types of captures, so we've done that $x expression, which tells you there's an expression type there, but you could also have an item, a block, a statement, a pattern, um, a type, an identifier, a path, um, a meta, and uh, also a single token tree so that you, instead of matching on like a full expression, you could just match on a, on a single token that's been parsed. And declarative macros are, are super flexible and they're really useful for, for doing things. If you can, if you can get um, if you can get straight in your head what you want something to do, then it's really easy to write a declarative macro for it. So for example, if I want to implement a trait using a declarative macro, if I know what it's going to look like every time. So for example, in the case of a struct, I've got two structs, point and point 3D, and I want to be able to call um, print line just like this. I don't want to have to use the colon question mark, I just want to have it to match the same as the um, debug implementation, but for display. So here, I don't know why I've mixed hashes and question marks, but here I've said, if I want to explicitly implement the trait, then I would end up doing something like this, where I've, where I've written out a specific implementation for display. But you'll notice that these two look pretty much identical. Ignore the difference there. I don't know why I've done that. Um, and so if we want, we could just write a macro that's going to write that code for us. And what that's going to look like is we could call it debug display. We could say I want to pass in some kind of identifier. And then we're saying implement format display for dollar $t. And then function format, formatting it, and then calling write using the debug implementation. And then by just calling debug display exclamation mark point, <clears throat> it's going to write that same trait code that we had here for both of them without needing to duplicate it. So if you have a lot of structs, then that, that would work. That would work quite quite well. Um, and you can do that for any any trait you want. If you can define it in a macro and pass in everything you need in, in one concise way, then you can, you can just write out these implementations. So sorry, I just noticed that there's seven messages in the chat. Uh, that number is really big. Are <laughs> uh, params forced to be the same type? Uh, no. So it's there is no type safety in your macros, apart from the fact that the code gets stamped out at compile time. If you put in a type that it doesn't work for, that the resulting code doesn't work, then it, it won't it won't work for you. Yeah, exactly. As as Matt says, the inference will cause an error. Um, OK, so the next question is, is, so are declarative macros in Rust hygienic? If you look online, um, it's defined as the macro is hygienic if expansion is guaranteed not to cause the accidental capture of identifiers. So are these declarative Rust macros hygienic? Well, I think one way to look at that kind of hy hygienicness is to, is to look at an example. So. If people want to put in the chat what you think this prints. <laughs> um, so what we've got is a macro that says define x. We're saying let x equal this, then we're saying print that. And notice there's no extra set of parentheses in here. So it's not being turned into an expression. Um, we're saying let x equal mains x and then calling this macro that lets x equal macros x and then prints it. So does anyone want to hazard a guess at what it what it might print? So Alex thinks macros x twice. Um, no other takers. So let's have a look at what it expands to. If you look at what it expands to, it seems like Alex is right. Initially, at first glance, you think, OK, well, I've shadowed the, the, the original x. 
with my new macro X and it's going to print macros X twice. That is not what happens. Yeah, exactly. So it prints macros mains. And the reason it does this, which is surprising, but it's what makes Rust macros that little bit more hygienic, is to do with the syntax context. So it actually prints mains X a second time. X isn't shadowed because the compiler is aware of the syntax context of that X. The X defined in here wasn't passed into the macro from main. And so as a result, this X is, exists in a totally different world to this X. Unless it's passed in, it won't pass out in, in, in this case. So because it's aware of the syntax context, like you'll see in kind of examples, you might see the like syntax highlighted differently in like where someone's highlighted to make it clear. But basically this X doesn't, doesn't exist here anymore. Um, so the original, the original X is um, is the one in that context. So yeah, expansion doesn't tell you everything basically, because if you look at this expansion, you would be absolutely forgiven for thinking it would be mains X twice, but it isn't because of this syntax syntax context, which I thought was thought was worth mentioning. But declarative macros are only considered partially hygienic because you can get examples where the names are leaking into each other. It with them um, with lifetimes and types so just just be aware they're not fully fully hygienic and we can still use macros to um define identifiers but they just they just need to be passed in so here we're saying create um oh wait i've mixed the letters up that should be an x <laughs> um create x this would be an x and then even though i haven't let x equal anything beforehand I've passed in this identifier's name, which you are all imagining in your mind's eye, says X. And then when I say let X equal 42, that X still exists, the name still exists in mains context, so you can still print it. And that's again, that's to do with where this is happening in the process of compilation. Um, so yeah, we can use X because it's defined in this scope and once the macro expands, it's defined and it exists as an identifier originally in the syntax context. Syntax context. Now, with that hygienicness in mind, that's not to say that you can't get name clashes. So if I use my macro to define a function, just like we did for implementing our trait, we now have two foos. There's no getting around that. <laughs> so you can't, you know, you will get multiple declarations of foo, but that's still, you know. That seems pretty reasonable. Otherwise, you couldn't define a function using a macro, which would be very sad. Another thing to know about is dollar crate. So dollar crate is um, a meta variable that is implicitly passed in. You always have access to it, and it allows you to reference the crate in which you are defining your macro. And this helps you so that um, in your when you're writing your macro, you know that the the, the types that you're calling there aren't going to clash with the calling codes types. Um, so if, if they've like, for example, renamed the standard library or <laughs> done something else strange or import or had their own, they haven't imported something and uh, or they've got some other other type um, and said, then it basically avoids that kind of shadowing. So yeah, you end up with something like this. In terms of resolving macros, when you've got multiple arms, you generally want to write it from most specific to least specific because like take expression, that's a very broad thing. In, in Rust, a lot of things satisfy expression. And um, so in, in this example, we're never going to match on the second arm because an identifier followed by a plus symbol is an expression. Even if it's not a valid expression because there's nothing afterwards, at the point at which this is done, um, in the abstract syntax tree type world. Um, this is just, this could just look like an expression. So, so you want to go for the most specific ones and then down to the least specific and just be aware that you might capture things. You might, you might be matching the arm, an arm you don't expect. A couple of other things to bear in mind. Um, generally, you can't have a repetition followed immediately by another repetition, even if the con contents um, don't conflict. 
um, it's kind of a safety. I don't know if that will change in the future if they don't conflict, but yeah, right now they don't. And we've kind of touched on this before, but macros don't have any trait bounds, but you'll still get the errors caught at compile time if the types that you are trying to use when you call your macro don't support the operations that the macro expansion is actually doing. Okay, so to summarize there, I think it's quite quickly, which is good. Um, macro rules look like macro rules, I'm missing an exclamation mark there, macro rules, exclamation mark, followed by your macro name, and then open brackets, close brackets with your expansion. You might need to add in additional brackets if you want to return the result as an expression. So for example, to say let x equal macro result. You call it with your macro name and an exclamation mark, or you could also use square brackets or curly braces. And the reason we do macros at all is to avoid duplicating boilerplate code, allow overloading with pattern matching and supporting variable numbers of parameters with repeat captures. If you want to go into a bit more detail, there's some really powerful um, declarative macros out there that can get quite complicated and quite hard to read, but I think they are worth sitting with. Um, the little book of Rust macros is a book from 2016 or something, but it has been, you know, the button's been taken up by someone else, so there is a more up-to-date version as well that goes through some of the some of the really useful macro syntaxes. Um, there's a YouTuber um, called John Gintet who has a nice video on declarative macros that goes through the vector example in a bit more detail. And then of course there's Rust by example in the Rust book as well are, are both really useful. So with that, I'm now gonna pass over to Chris, who I think is hopefully gonna kind of talk to us a bit about what how he found um, declarative macros and um, open, up, open up some discussion on it, hopefully. Yeah, thank you, Kira. Uh, can you hear me? Am I okay? I just changed mics. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, right. So for today, I was going to plan because macros is is pretty difficult, and I don't fully understand them. So I was like, well, what's the best way to get into it? Is to do like an example project, uh, just something which is practical, something which I actually need. Um, and I have come to a bit of an existential crisis with macros in a way, uh, mostly because of I don't I, I feel like I'm not smart enough to understand them. That's the first problem that I've got. Um, but also the other problem is um, is what I think macro should be used for. So, and that's quite a naive thing to say. Um, so, what I kind of want is I want to kind of, if you kind of think about in a video game where you've got some text, some scrolling text, and it changes at different speeds um, depending on what's scrolling. So, think about like Zelda. You know, if you've played Zelda with the text kind of scrolling, I was like. What a perfect way I can use include bytes or include string, which is a macro, which basically compile times a, a, a file into the binary, and then I can process that binary and pass it basically as a script where the speed variation kind of changes, maybe I can change the color and things like that, and then I can present it in my game engine. I was like, oh, that's fantastic. And I started building in a macro, um, and I got my results straight away, and I got something which was great. And then I kind of realized what I've done is I've just written a function that just parses a string. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, that's not what you should use a macro for. I just written the function. So I was like, okay, well, I can, macros are great because they're compile time. Um, so maybe I can write a compile time um, macro that can allow me to pass this, 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 uh, this script uh, into what I want it to do. Um, all the the problems aside with parsing strings with at compile time, which is very difficult. Um, what I wrote effectively was a const function um, and not suitable for a macro. Um, and then I just kind of started thinking about, so hang on, what should I be using macros for? Because there are some useful macros within the Rust like standard library, which we kind of use like, you know, vec exclamation point format. Um, include bytes, include string, um, and there's some usual third-party ones like parsing, um, like numerical values at compile time. Um, and then I just got thinking, like you know, macros in C plus plus and in Rust are inherently um, you know, difficult to read, difficult to understand. They're, they're quite esoteric, and well, the the long the, the long story is is that. I don't really know why I should be using macros. 
Um, so does anybody have any good ideas what some practical applications of macros in their own project that they that they think they'll be using? Um, and should macros be used as a last resort or should it be used as a way to interface into into your application? Um, for example, you know, there's a graphics or a games engine called MacroQuad, which is basically just using macros and it, and it takes away all of that um, the interface away from the user and just kind of builds their own kind of like a, effectively their own language through macros on how to use it and it's not intuitive so yeah any ideas about you know what i should be building for macros that's that's the question uh alex your your mic's not coming through but you're not muted i don't know what's going on but i think you were going to say that matt in the chat said Converting strings to hashes or converting string literals to C strings for C interfaces, reducing boilerplate. Yeah, I could just talk, couldn't I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, a, a compile time conversions is useful. Um, yeah, it's something that C couldn't do until recently is um, if I wanted to put a string in, but I wanted to compile time converted to a hash so i got uh, cheap compares um c++ only was able to do that very recently um with const expressions now um you know, rust can do that with, with with vectors and i i found i've written some vectors my uh, well, vectors um macros i've written some macros myself to to help aid with interfacing with c um apis because converting um Rust strings into C strings, which are null terminated, are, are a pain in the ass. And there they, they, they hasn't any crate to do it nicely that I've, I've come across. Uh, so I've built up a library of that. Um, so in those cases, it, sorry, in those cases, Matt, the, the very, that's very specific. You, you've got a very specific problem that you're trying to, trying to optimize uh, at compile time. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. You're not. Uh, yeah. You're not, yes. You're I, I do the, the work. Interface, I, 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 no, I'm not. I'm not calculating anything in runtime. I, I want. I want to. Ins like, for example, say I want. I just want to store a hash. Um, so say you've got a file with a, with a name, but the, it, it, the um, which is say so you've generated a, a, a binary with 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 which from a source has strings, but inside the binary has hashes. But you want to re reference it, so you, you want to reference it by string, not by the hash. You can do uh, like a, a macro to, to do a um, compile time conversion converting. Um, but any, anywhere where you're repeating code a lot, uh, uh, syntactically, um, you, you can use a, a, a macro. Um, why, I think good why example. Would I, sorry, why would I use a macro instead of a closure? For what specifically? Well, yeah. Um... I'm just trying. Uh, do you know of any examples where I would use a macro over a closure for repeating code? You can't implement a trait with a closure, so you can't. You can't do for that. The trait implementation, I think, is the real classic for the use of use of macros. You can't stamp out a function like that um, using another function because it's not. <laughs> that's not how code works. So um, that would be, I'd say, the big one. But the the strong typeness with, with traits in in Rust is is really one of the strongest parts of the language that that I that I consider. Um, you don't you don't lose that, so you don't lose any of the any of the safety you had. Um, you just because it's still you know it's still going to check all of that at compile time. It's just writing the code for you basically. <laughs> So you see, what, ma what macros do is an actual substitution, but a substitution at the AST level. So it's taking the the the, the invocation of your macro, say vec hash and, and the brackets, pulling that out, processing that, and producing some new AST, which is then just inserted in place. And then the compiler just run over it as if it was normal Rust code. Um, so the macros don't have to do anything special to, to check things like safety and so forth. Um, a, 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 another, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, um, say, say, say you want another example could be um, if you had to define, if you want to register a type and you, you have to generate a bunch of structures um, 
that that uh, that can in like um, reflection something like that. You you can then wrap you can just stick a type in a, in a macro and then the macro just generate all the data structures you need to have runtime reflection for example. Because uh, that 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 involves boilerplate. It, it, it kind of kind of well, just you, you want to generate code. If you need to generate code from some source which isn't code, macros is useful. Okay, thank you. Also, the, the compiled time reflection, right? So this is basically, I think, what the debug display said uh, is doing. Yes. So, but um, I, I was talking about runtime reflection. Um, if you if you wanted that, in, like in, in a game engine or something. And and when we when we do procedural macros next time, that's when you get maximum flexibility, where you can basically manipulate the AST <laughs> to to quite um quite significant levels in order to in order to write your to write your code. You get a lot more flexibility, a lot more power, a lot more room to. Do, do things wrong as well, but yeah. I, I was actually thinking of using a macro, not a declarative one, but a procedural macro to do a, a Z80 assembler. So I could write Z80 assembler in mnemonics within a macro and it was generate a string, an array of bytes in Rust uh, for some, you know, for, I, I don't know if I got the time for that, but please, please bring it along. <laughs> if you do, <laughs> you can get it done in, in two weeks. That'll be great. That'll be. Oh, no chance. I got <laughs> so much going on. Do Rust macros give you the same sort of abilities we're used to in C macros, like being able to stringify a name um, or to concatenate several identifiers together to create a new identifier? Or can you only do sort of legitimate Rust substitutions? Not not through macro rules, I don't think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Kara. Okay. Uh, you... Go on. Because <laughs> there is a stringify macro, but like you say, I think it's I think it's a procedural macro, but I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. But there is an existing macro that you can just call called stringify. Um, that would. That's all right. So long as I can do it. <laughs> so 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 with procedural macros, which will be described later, you can actually run your own custom code that can can study the AST and and, and just run a program that runs a compile time uh, that can produce new um, syntax. So you can do you can surround some text with quotes and insert that into the syntax tree. And that's pretty what Stringify does. See, that's really that really excites me, but I'm also really scared about. Um, <laughs> procedural macros, which I should probably suggest why I should present the next uh, book club about procedural, macro, procedural macros. Yeah, the best way to learn is to teach it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Presumably, Matt, your example of converting a string to a hash would also use procedural macros. Uh, yes. I, I could, because otherwise I couldn't yes. see how the... The, the the code or the declarative macros that Kira showed today would just put a no, load of code in I, I place and it would have to compile it and run it at runtime. I think you're correct, yes. So, yeah, so declarative macros don't give you a huge amount of extra stuff. That's why they're called, you know, that's why they often get called macros by example, because they're just saying, you know, I could have written this code. I don't want to write it. Here, here is what it is. So it's, you know, it's main uses. Uh, avoiding duplicate um, boilerplate code, allowing overloading, um, because you can't overload function names in Rust. So, without without macros, you you, know, you basically end up with fifty functions with the same name in certain contexts, and then variable yeah. numbers of parameters because we don't have variadic tem templates. This is the alternative. They kind kind of like better C macros that knows about hygiene and and, and you, know, you think it, if in the future rust did get variadic parameters for regular functions that would take away you know a big use case for declarative macros i don't see why you ever would um put in additional syntax because it kind of does the trick as it is um because <laughs> declarative macros are pretty they're, they're yeah they're not they're not too bad they're i think they do they satisfy that requirement um 
I guess I've got the same gut feelings as Chris that do. My, my gut reaction is to minimize the use of macros to, to the absolute essential bit that only they can do and to immediately delegate everything else to functions as much as possible. <laughs> yes, you should might do that. It just be a matter but... of unlearning it. You should do that um, because it, it, otherwise it'll just confuse um, the read of your code. But obviously, uh, you haven't messed with Lisp at all in your past that much. I knew you should say that. <laughs> because you wouldn't be frightened of macros otherwise. <laughs> but I, unfortunately, I like Lisp. Um, you, um, Lisp as, 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 a, as a power, superpower, and that is data and code are equivalent in syntax yeah and because that, that isn't the case in rust so you have to deal mm. with the abstract syntax tree the ast which we're going to be thinking a lot about with procedural macros because you have to a lot more explicitly think about it the nice thing about declarative macros is they're very very lightweight they're very easy to you don't need to pull in any additional crates you don't need to do anything special you just get access to this little bit of extra syntax that allows you to cookie cutter certain code um, and it's once you get used to the syntax, they're very, very nice to work with. They're not super readable when they get really long, but yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 what, that's one advantage of the declarative ones that you, you just hinted on is that the fact um, with declarative procedural macros, you need them in a separate crate yeah. because the compiler has to compile them in, in, into a plugin almost to run on your code. And you have to pull in additional dependencies as well, even just to write them. You know, you're relying on, was it, I don't know how to say it, S-Y-N, SIN? You don't have to use that. You don't have to, <laughs> but it makes things an awful lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, have to if you want to live. <laughs> yeah, that all. They're a, yeah, they're a, they're a great tool and um next session hopefully this will be like a nice kind of like i feel like declarative macros is like a warm-up for procedural macros <laughs> but it, it should also you know people shouldn't forget about them they are useful and i i don't think there's anything you can write with a declarative macro that you can't write with a procedural macro although correct me if i'm wrong Matt. but declarative macros are a lot simpler and a lot lighter well i, I would imagine the the macro rules macro is a declarative macro not quite. Macro I don't think rules, procedural. I meant procedural. I meant, I meant but procedural. It's not, it's not even that. You couldn't write macro rules <laughs> using the tools we have available to us as people no, writing Rust code. Crate. It's like, no, you can't. It's, it's in the language. There's, there's some uh, compiler right. magic going on. Um, Cheaters. Yeah. And then also, I think the derive derive keyword i think we couldn't like that that matching syntax of derive open brackets um mm -hmm. attribute close brackets you couldn't write that yourself with like another word of like derive two um it's as far as i'm aware that can't be written um with the rust tools available to us lowly developers <laughs> so one of the craziest things i've seen used of procedural macros is generating html code in strings so you you actually almost write html um, in your Rust uh, natively, and it gets converted to a string at compile time. So you, you can do like HTML open brace, and then inside you can then do div open brace, and so on. And it's just crazy. There's a similar similar Python one that I, that I've looked up for. Yeah, it's, it gives you oh, too much power. Too much. I, I think a really really good a good. Um, uh, I think I just thought of one. You, um, that you, you can do is uh, maybe implement uh, Prolog in a Rust in a Rust uh, macro. Something I might I might look at. So you can you run a Prolog virtual machine at runtime, but you you can state the rules using that macro, and so you can use it for declarative um, logic in in your AI routines or something like that, or if you want to do an expert system. Or... I think that that'd be really cool. Yes, it definitely would be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Maybe, maybe. There are too many projects. Can't do this. <laughs> cool. Um, have we got anything in the chat? I um, think with the declarative. Sorry. No, it's all right. I was just going to 
touch on the chat basically. Um, so Tim did pipe up just before we started talking about uh, variadic functions, just to mention that Rust didn't have them, and then but we had the whole chat. Um, but he did point out that he started writing or he has written a small guide for Rust for Perl programmers, and he has a macros chapter that he's writing on. Um, so do check it out. It's, there's a link in the chat. Do I have to know Perl to read it? One way to find out. Only one way to find <laughs> <Yes>. out. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> that's the intended audience. I just put that link in for because that's what I was commenting on. And, uh, and, if you're coming to Rust from a language that does have periodic functions, you might say, what well, and then you know, <laughs> yeah. we can fix it. You know, I mean, we don't need it. Yeah, definitely. All right, shall we, shall we wrap it up there then? I feel like we're all gonna be reading about procedural macros for the next week and bringing our favorite ones along. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I, I'll send out. I'm gonna be reading up on Prologue. <laughs> Seeing it. Thank you very much, Kira. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, great talk. Actually, it has helped help me revise a lot of the information. That's great. Very it's a little odds and ends. Is <laughs> Alex? Yeah. Thanks okay, for coming, Alex. everyone. Oh, you guys did all the heavy lifting. Don't worry about it. <laughs> bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye.